I want to now take this conversation to a different level with my panelists. I want to tell all my panelists that imagine all of you were sitting in the audience watching this panel and listening to us, your younger self. You are younger, you are studying or working somewhere in this metro and you're experiencing a lot of stress, anxiety, and you want, want to find out what is a meaningful career in life. Everybody out there knows that there is something which is larger than all of this and we want a simple path to find it. So based on your 20 to 30 years of experience that you have lived as monks, what is that one thing and one thing only that summarizes everything that you have experienced in the last 20 to 30 years that to you want to send or that you want to say to your younger self so that they can understand what is a meaningful life and how they can find it. So what would be that one quick answer that you can give to this question to your younger self. Uh, Madhu Pandeji, would you like to start? Yeah, I would, I would tell this, you know, person that, uh, you know, you need to really read Srila Prabhupada's books and you really find out that there's a completely different perspective, a, a worldview that can give meaning to your life. Ultimately, it doesn't matter finally, you know, whether, you know, uh, which way you practice Krishna consciousness, staying outside or inside, but you will see the universality of the messages for transforming your life. So that, that's the message I would tell him that he should start reading specifically Bhagavad Gita uh, as it is by Srila Prabhupada and then that will definitely make a big impact. Chanchla Patiji, how about you? I would say, just thinking, look, about, look at the universe all around us. Look at the world. It's a very complex universe. The stars and the moon and the sun and the planets, all of this is revolving around. And it's a, what is this complex arrangement for? What is the purpose? What is the meaning? So, I would inspire that person to think about it and we are too small in the whole cosmos to figure out that. We are so teeny as a human being and our intelligence, our, pers our powers of cognition are all very limited. So here in our ancient Vedic literatures, there is a certain perspective to explain all of this. And I would inspire him uh, to think about it and find a meaning, find a purpose. And that will help him, you know, the message of the Bhagavad Gita, the message of the Upanishads and the Vedic literatures, it provides a certain perspective which is going to enrich your life, I will say. How about you, Stoka Swamiji? There are several things in spiritual life that can enrich our uh, daily activities, just like we eat every day. But have you ever considered there is a spiritual way of eating? Then something called offering to Krishna and eating prasadam that can enrich your life so much that you can really properly relish whatever you are eating irrespective of external situation, etc. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Amit Asnaji, your views. Uh, many years back, I attended a seminar in which the presenter gave this nice example. So he illustrated the point using a pen where he said that, let's say this part of the pen represents the starting point of our life, the day we took birth. And let's say this part represents the day we leave this world. 
we leave this body and the length of the pen represents our lifetime so the person who was giving this presentation he asked one of the audience okay if this represents your life where are you currently so the lady got up and then she did a quick calculation keeping an average lifespan of about 80 years she thought i am 40 years so she came forward and indicated somewhere here so the presenter asked are you very sure and in the meantime all the audience started laughing and then the presenter made a statement we can't be so sure more so in present times with the current pandemic life is very uncertain many times we have an understanding that spirituality is important but maybe i should wait till i get retired post retirement i can take it up so my message would be that life is short we have got this human birth it's a rare opportunity athato brahma jigyasa so better late better we start now when we have when we are young we have intelligence to comprehend things so spirituality cannot be postponed for post retirement uh, activity where we can you know so to say indulge in it it is the right time where when we are young we can plunge into it so vyakta ji your views on this what message would you give to your younger self well uh, so just as it is important to know how the world works it's also important to know how we how our mind works how our how our intelligence works and how we can interact with the world around us in a much better way so we have books of physics we have books of mathematics we have books of different branches of knowledge so we need a book of knowledge about ourselves also and that book is the bhagavad gita and shri lakshmi prabhupada's bhagavad gita as it is is a wonderful manual for all of us if we study it and lead our life according to it then we can be assured of a life which is free of stress a life with which we can face the challenges and difficulties in life and we can lead a much more meaningful life vasudev ji your views share my views with what madhu pandit prabhu ji and suvekta narsimha prabhu ji said both of them stressed on the importance of reading bhagavad gita to lead a life free from stress all answers are there in the bhagavad gita for any problem that we face in our life whether we get angry or whether we are losing friends or whether our minds are full of stress we are full of anxiety we are looking for something some solutions in life all problems are there in bhagavad gita so prabhupada says very good this is what i want you to real wanted you to realize if you if anyone reads bhagavad gita all his problems will seem trivial and there will be answers to everything so this was the story of bhagavad gita which solved all his problems jeev ji yeah i would like to add to what uh, vasudev uh, krishna prabhu said uh, yes definitely uh, if we see the example of a practical example of pandavas even though they were along with lord krishna they had to undergo series of difficulties but they never gave it up rather because of the presence of the lord and the spiritual strength they had they were able to cross it over another point i would like to add is that by spiritual strength by by that we get the mercy of the lord also it is said in bhagavatam that by his mercy our problems which may be like an ocean actually it will become reduced to the size of a calf's hoof print ocean is very difficult to cross over but it is not very difficult to cross over a small hoof print of a cow which may have water in it so this is another aspect i would like to add to it fascinating satya gora ji your views <laughs> i would say that uh, if you are under uh, tremendous stress and a lot of problems 
you should not decide the solution yourself you should approach a spiritual master who can guide you properly so that you can face all these challenges i would say the spiritual life squarely depends on the quality of guru that we select if we make any mistake in this selection process uh, we may end up in a, a different direction and waste a lot of time and energy and finally we may not might not have solved any of our problems so i want to give uh, one or two tips of how to select a proper spiritual master one thing is if the spiritual master is coming in a ancient tradition an ancient denomination the one which has survived thousands of years and the spiritual master belongs to such a parampara it is a very safe selection and secondly if that parampara extends up to krishna that means the spiritual master is having his own spiritual master and he has his own spiritual master from krishna himself that is the most safest so while we want to uh, pursue we want to understand the meaning of life and we also want to uh, implement that into our day to day life it is uh, very important that we select a a bona fide uh, spiritual master so we should not go by externals uh, of how he wears a certain dress or how he looks but we should go by uh, which denomination or which ancient parampara he belongs to then we are very safe and whatever instructions that spiritual master gives and whatever commentaries he gives on the basis of bhagavad gita we can happily accept and we can make our life successful okay so rakesh ji i would like to add to what uh, everybody has said so interestingly if you would have seen uh, all of us all the speakers when we were speaking we were talking about bhagavad gita about a spiritual master different uh, spiritual uh, thoughts we were sharing so uh, the viewer who is there he might be feeling that uh, why are all of us suggesting uh, something which uh, why we are not suggesting something which is more practical or something which uh, somebody like say a professional uh, psychiatrist or somebody like that or a counselor may propose so to understand that uh, what i would like to uh, say is that when we look at problems uh we have to understand that there are two kinds of solutions that we can look at every problem for uh one is to look at some material uh, way of solving it another is to turn towards uh spirituality like uh, the philosophy of the bhagavad gita now the difference between these two is very simple whenever we try to find a material solution to our problems then what happens is it creates a further problem just like uh, we uh, try to solve the problem of uh, transport by inventing the motor car but what did we do we ended up warming up the whole global climate we thought we can solve the problem of hot summers by inventing the air conditioner but what did we end up doing we put a hole in the ozone layer so any material solution we try to find to our problems it will create some other problem whereas if we look at, if we look to the bhagavad gita if we look to spirituality for our as uh, for the solutions for our problems then the solution that we will give you will get will be far more uh, benign it will not end up generating more problems for you that's what i uh, i would like to add to uh, whatever everybody all the other speakers had to say there is one uh, there is one statement of uh, i think it was einstein who said if there is a problem you should solve the problem the same problem the level at which the problem is if you try to solve you will never be able to you have to go to another level and then solve the problem 
So that's the approach that we do. At the material level, different kinds of problems exist for people. So we go to another level called the spiritual level, a spiritual perspective. From there, we look at the world of this, this world and we try to find solutions. That's the approach that we do in spirituality. Uh, the example, there is one interesting example. There was a man carrying a big load on his head. You know, after because of the load, he started feeling pain in the neck. So he moved the big load from his head to his shoulder. And now he felt a lot of relief in his neck. And then he kept walking. After a little while, he started feeling this shoulder was aching. And then he felt that, okay, now the shoulder is aching. And he moved the load from one shoulder to the other shoulder. And he found great relief. But then after a while, it started weighing here. So the question is that then he started thinking, why am I carrying this load at all? Can I get rid of the load? so that I can be free. So it's a different dimension of solution that we look for. So uh, these are some examples given in the Vedic literatures uh, to find solutions to spiritual solutions to material problems. In one of the uh, presentations I made in the college, a young man in the end, he stood up and he said, why should I believe in what Bhagavad Gita says? And uh, because I, 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 I explained that, you know, Bhagavad Gita reveals the absolute truth and all those things, I, my talk was in those directions. So why should I believe in Bhagavad Gita? And uh, I asked him a question, do you uh, believe in, a, in your chemistry textbook? No, I believe it because you know it's uh, it's written by a professor and uh, authorized and university has recommended this author and so I believe in it. So I said, how different is it, Bhagavad Gita? So the, the finally, it's not about Bhagavad Gita or chemistry book. It is about the content inside. Mm. Who is speaking? Now you are saying that person is authorized person. The university has authorized that person. Now, you do not know about this university that exists for long, 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 long years. This is called Parampara. So somebody in Parampara is authorized and authorized and the university is only, a, you know, has a beginning now. But this university is of transcendental knowledge is coming from Krishna himself. So then, then he said, everybody will say the same thing. You know, it's coming from Krishna. Who knows where is Krishna is? What is Krishna? We do not know. We do not know. You are saying Vyasadev. All the, I do not know. But here I am seeing Mr. Professor Ramachandran is still alive and he's written the book. I said, why do you see? Why do you have to see Ramachandran? Why don't you see the content in it? Finally, your textbook, even if it is authorized also, next test is what? You go and experiment it. And you see it is, it is, it is proving. So in the same way, forget, keep it. You develop your faith later. You take some things in the Bhagavad Gita and go and experiment. In the case of chemistry textbook, the experiment is in the laboratory. But here the laboratory is your body, your mind. Please follow the condition just like in, 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 in chemistry, you, you know, hydrogen and oxygen has to be mixed in a particular temperature and pressure. Then only your experiment will be successful. Similarly, here also, I take up this challenge. Don't just, without taking up the challenge, you cannot say what is written there is not true. So apply that, apply the same conditions to your body, your mind, whatever it is. Just like I would say, you should not intoxicate, you should not do this, you should not do this, etc. This is personal. No, no, no. This may be personal, but now we are talking about personal realization. Bhagavad Gita is about person. Bhagavad Gita is about self-realization. It is not about realizing what what uh, water is made up of. So here the subject matter is the body and the mind. So if you want to find out, you go for it. And then, then he was convinced. You know, so the whole idea is people today do not understand. The moment we say Bhagavad Gita and think they say this has this is something, you know, ancient. In once upon a time, as Vasudevji uh, said, or uh, uh, yeah, that uh, uh, this uh, text should have its, uh, these texts 
once upon a time if you say vyasadev it would get respect once you say you know some <laughs> old rishi said you'll get respect now it's like it's become ulta people want to okay, who is the person who is living who has who has read who has who has uh, 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 you know speaking all these things who is so big then i can accept yeah. so anyway of course prabhupada is great and uh, uh, prabhupada has, has uh, you know spread krishna consciousness uh, changed transform transform thousands of people's lives so that itself is we can tell that you know this is this is his book you read it yeah. i just wanted to add something to all what others are saying to uh, uh, on uh, on this particular important question that amit uh, amit ji has asked amit ji it is like this prabhupa gave another example suppose you are buying diamond you know diamond is a very expensive thing and you have to shell out a lot of money so you have to be careful that you get the right diamond for the value for the amount you are going to spend so you need to have some basic knowledge to identify a diamond another word that uh, subyakta ji used was due diligence right that's a word that is in the modern world so you have to do due diligence about diamond suppose you are looking for diamond and you go to a hardware shop there's a man who is selling nails hammers screwdrivers and such things and you go and tell him can i buy diamond from you and the man will look up and down at you and say ah oh, come i'll give you i've got one 5 kilo diamond here and he'll give you wrought iron or something like that and say it this cost lakhs of rupees and if you don't know how to discern a diamond from iron we are likely to get cheated in the same way when it comes to our choosing a spiritual master we are going to give something very valuable our life it's like somebody trying to pay lakhs of rupees and buy diamond in the same way here you're going to give your life it's not a small thing so don't give it away for something that's not worth it so one it is said in the shastras that the disciple should make pariksha of the guru should make a test of the guru and the guru also makes a pariksha of the disciple whether he is really sincerely seeking the truth so there is a phase in our spiritual quest where we are looking for a guru trying to understand who is the right guru who has the right qualifications and for that we must have a little bit of a preliminary knowledge so that we go and go to the right guru and submit ourselves and test that guru make sure you know from a distance what happens in iskon practically i'll tell you when somebody comes to iskon in our to our temples we uh that that person usually gets to see our environment our organization our what we do our lifestyle and what we speak what what kind of a philosophy we have so in this way the person gets an exposure of spiritual principles and over a period of time the person has we expect him to reflect on it and then become really convinced that yes this is the right thing to do and we allow him please come and ask questions you have you know you can ask any question no issue and we try to answer the questions logically and on the basis of vedic scriptural knowledge on authoritative scriptural knowledge so in this way uh, a person is allowed to think carefully intelligently logically and try to understand and build his or her conviction and that's what we do so i hope that helps amit ji thanks a lot for joining us i hope you got your answer from the esteemed panelists okay <clears throat> all right so i'll now take the question uh, to madhu pandit ji um i have come and stayed with all of you at the temple and i also have participated in the mangal aarti 
and then i noticed that all of you spend lot of time in chanting and uh, when you sit down and chant it's a process which is very enlightening but then many of us out there sometimes we don't have the right patience to keep on doing certain things we don't have the patience to read books we don't have the patience to sit down and chant we don't have sometimes the patience to do our work more than a few minutes distractions get low so my question to you madhu pandit ji is what are your tips for all of us to learn how to stay focused and keep doing this so that we don't get distracted and we keep doing our work yeah uh, first thing is that this every process of uh, bhakti that is recommended by the spiritual master whether it is chanting or reading or any of these things uh, to keep our mind on that for a prolonged time is very difficult in this age all kinds of you know whether even if we are devotees in the temple also the nature of the mind is to you know run away to different things like when you are chanting the mind just runs away every so uh, the solution to that is first understanding is that anything that you do as a service to the lord we need to understand that lord helps us so it's not only me in the scene offering something that the lord is also giving me the strength association for instance if you want to hold on to the chanting without distraction of your mind then you sh- you should the, the the process if you understand the properly the krishna consciousness then you know that the holy name itself provides the strength to keep your mind on the holy name the holy name himself has got gives the the energy the shakti the chesta shakti the mind control everything whatever is required to hold on is coming from the holy name itself every process of bhakti is helped by krishna that means this is just like not is not other process of yoga where you know there is a destination and then till you reach the destination you are alone struggle struggle in bhakti it's not like that continuously you god helps those who help themselves you try to keep your mind together and then you will immediately see the lord is reciprocating and then you know it becomes you know the, the your your concentration your attention remains on that so in other words when we do these activities you have to think i am not alone krishna is all attractive so he will attract my mind whether it is to the reading or whether it is to the chanting he will attract my mind so if you have this faith and anticipate his help whether it is chanting or anything anticipate his help you will see mystically many thing you know your mind is completely you know lined up without any distraction in other words you can do seva of the lord nicely only by his mercy that secret one should understand and anticipate that mercy and then you are on the path but then this whole time is and i remember all of you have a very precision timetable that you don't miss for a single minute right now suvyakta ji said that we don't want any holidays we want to work more is there any scope of fun in the life of a monk at the temple uh, or is it only work and spirituality and reading so i'm sure there must be something that you all experience is there any element of fun in your lives our day starts with a lot of fun we start our day in the morning with singing and dancing what can be more fun than this <laughs> stoka swami ji you have a hand Yeah, Prabhupada was asked by one reporter that, uh, "What do you do for fun?" So Prabhupada says that every activity we do is filled with fun only. 
as Subhakta ji mentioned, morning we get up and then we don't have any dry kind of regiment, regimen for our morning uh, sadhana. We come to the temple hall and we have darshan of beautiful deities and we have melodious singing and dancing. So who begins the day with singing and dancing? Can you point out anybody who is beginning the day with singing and dancing? So like that and we have wonderful prashadam to take and we have nice discussions on very nice philosophy and this philosophy the way it is given in the Bhagavatam especially wonderful pastimes of the Lord, wonderful activities of the devotees of the great uh, devotees mentioned in the Bhagavatam. So it's enlivening. Every single thing we do is enlivening us to do more. So where is question of uh, any boredom? Chanchala Pati ji. <clears throat> what happens is, it's like this. According to a person's consciousness, a person looks for fun in that field. According to the development of an, a, a person's intelligence, consciousness, he looks for fun in that field. So what has happened to all of us, or rather, I shouldn't just speak about us, what happens to a person who is practicing spiritual life, as taught in the Bhagavad Gita, is that we look for another quality of pleasure and happiness in this world. It is not sensual pleasure because sensual pleasure is fleeting and you have to struggle a lot to get that and invariably it becomes miserable after some time. So we have by spiritual knowledge, training and educa spiritual education we learn to become sensitive and discover and perceive a higher quality of pleasure. And hence, those simple activities from somebody outsider looking at us, you're, like Swamiji said, you're just chanting the three words again and again, over and over, and you're finding pleasure. Yes, because we have discovered another world of spiritual pleasure, that is very fulfilling. You know, the songs we sing in the temple, it is the same song. In fact, those songs are being sung last 300 years since it was composed. And we sing the same songs and those songs give us so much bliss. Because another thing about spiritual enlightenment is that every day there is a freshness in spiritual of understanding. So the although it's the same song, those songs have unlimited depth in it and it opens up newer and newer understanding and newer realizations and so it's very relishing. So it may be the same song, same new, same words, but it gives new joy every day. I tell you one experience. I was for the temple, we were doing a film some years ago, and I was dealing with a few, the filmmakers were in New York. So I was uh, talking to different people connected with the filmmaking world, and then beyond the formal official meetings, they would ask me what we do, what's our lifestyle like, and then I would tell them that we rise early in the morning. We come at four o'clock to the temple in the morning, and we start singing the our our way of praying and our worship is singing and dancing and that's our way of uh, worship because that's the kind of worship that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught and we come in the parampara and the lineage of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I was telling all these things to one or two of them uh, outside of the formal professional official meetings. So one day we were all still talking and then somehow we were talking about the script and the film and and so it started uh, they started talking about uh, so one of those persons he was an american and uh, 
he said, uh, they, they call me, I, I wouldn't give my full name because Chanchala Pati Das is a bit of a tongue twister for an American, for a Western. So I would make them my name, my, I would just say I am CP. So they would call me a CP. So uh, this one American started telling to the others who are also all, all were Americans. Do you know what CP does for fun? And CP gets up early in the morning at four o'clock and he has a bath and then he comes to his temple. And the first thing he does is singing and dancing. Can you ever imagine that? An early morning, four o'clock, and all those Americans, they are thinking, you know, when do we go for, when, when do we sing and dance? It's somewhere late in the night or something. We get drunk and then maybe we sing and dance. So CP begins every day singing and dancing. Oh my God, what fun he must be having. <laughs> That's actually the fact. So uh, uh, we have real fun in spirituality. If that awakening, that understanding opens up for a new vocabulary, a new understanding of fun and spiritual life as Krishna promises, Susukam Kartumavyayam. This path is full, filled with joy and that we experience it. So every moment is fun moment for a monk. Absolutely. So Vyakta Ji. Yeah, I'd like to add a similar experience to what uh, Prabhu just now explained. Uh, when I was in the uh, Bangalore temple, I remember one corporator from uh, Delhi had come, one Mr. Khan, and uh, he had come to uh, uh, see our Akshay Patra kitchen and look at our uh, how the cooking process happens, how they get the food, gets distributed to the food, and those kind of stuff. So he stayed with us, uh, with us in the temple for about two days, and uh, I was interacting with him, and uh, there were a couple of other devotees also who were interacting with him, taking him around, explaining things to him and all that. So in the on the second day, the evening, we were starting for dinner. So he looked at me and he said, I have one question for you. I said, please go ahead. So he said, I see all of you devotees. You all have a beaming smile always on your faces. And I can see it's not only on your face. Even your eyes show that people are very happy. How can you people be so happy? I have never, I, I, I'm a corporator, I'm in the public life, I meet so many people. I never find people whose eyes are filled with so much joy. So, whatever we are doing, it actually is a process which automatically fills our heart with happiness. And uh, uh, all of us may uh, share various uh, ways how uh, this process of chanting and uh, hearing the, uh, singing the same song and all of those kind of things are so joyous to all of us. But it's like explaining how honey is so sweet to a person who has never tasted honey. So the best way is that you take that a spoon of that honey and put it in your mouth and then you can really relish the sweetness of honey. So in a similar way, anybody who takes up Chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra, anybody who takes up reading Prabhupada's books, he can, without fail, experience the same kind of joy. Absolutely. On this particular thing, on the question of fun, and there was a moment of conversation of Prasadam, here is my personal question, which was unplanned, but I have to ask. All of you eat such nourishing Prasadam made in the temple, and I see that the prasadam is so nice, delicious, and you eat it to your fullest. But despite that, all of you are so fit. And this is one problem I know we all have when we live outside that we want to eat nourishing, nice food, but then it also makes us nice and uh, different. But all of you are extremely fit. So is it a part of this whole process of being a monk that you do yoga and other activities, which are part of the whole fun? And I think your food is also a very big part of your fun. Uh, definitely what you said is true. Um, all, uh, you know, fun activities have to end in good food. Yeah, imagine you have a great evening filled with a lot of fun activities, but at the end of the day, the food is terrible. You will end up cursing the whole program, right? So, food has to be always great. In our case, 
it's not just food it is food which is offered to krishna which is prasadam so that gives it a completely different quality to it it's not only nourishing for the body it is also nourishing for the mind and for the heart so actually what happens is uh, food by itself uh, may not be the real cause for our bodily ailments that many people experience they eat good food and they end up having a lot of trouble actually what happens is the mind has a big role to play if your mind is disturbed then no matter how great the food is eventually you will end up with a lot of uh, physical ailments so and that's what we are seeing in this world today so if you see how the world was a few decades ago uh, people were a lot more uh, led a lot more simpler lives they had a lot lesser uh, uh, facilities and conveniences in life but they used to be far healthier because they used to be more happier and contented today we have much much better facilities medical science has evolved technology has evolved but then people's uh, uh, cases of depression and people's uh, mental uh, uh, health has gone down considerably so somewhere most of the ailments can be tracked back to the mental health of the person and if you want to keep the mental health um, good then without uh, spirituality it is not possible and if you see how in the last few decades how the civilizations have progressed with time the societies have got disconnected from their spiritual heritages and consequently what has happened the problems and diseases have only increased so somewhere what i would feel is disconnecting ourselves from the spirituality is actually the root cause of most of the problems that people are facing yes rajiv ji and vasudev ji you also are trying to say something please go ahead one by one rajiv ji please go ahead yeah so i would like to add uh, uh, two small points to what suvakta narsimha prabhu said Uh, it's not only just the mental health which is important uh, along with that <clears throat> the food has to be very tasty nourishing but quantity is very important prabhu pad says the reason of all diseases is either you are under eating or you are over eating so if we can control the quantity of what we eat and eat what is required to maintain the body and the soul together then i would feel that it will keep the body free from diseases absolutely vasudev ji the the food although we are eating to our fullest is still keeping us fit and healthy is because this is food that has been tasted by krishna and it has been infected by infected by krishna like the example is given if a food which has been touched by a diseased person is tasted by someone else then that person also gets diseased because this person passes on his disease to him through the food so similarly this food is something that has been touched by krishna so if we eat that food prasadam then we also get infected by krishna by krishna consciousness so krishna is completely pure you know the greatest person so if we eat food uh, touched by him we also become purified and we become healthy but yes eating the right quantity is very important as uh, rajilochan prabhu ji pointed out so that is something that we all have we take care and uh, we have some systems for that in the ashram but everybody is given freedom to eat as much as he wants Chanchalapati ji was saying something. I just wanted to add one sentence only. Prabhu Pad said, "To be a yogi, a yogi eats half his stomach with food, fills half his stomach with food, and a quarter with water, and the other quarter is left empty." So I think if we follow this uh, formula, even if it's very delicious food, we will not only relish it. we will not become unhealthy so that for a long time in our life we can continue to relish good food uh, uh, there was a question i wanted to ask 
uh, Chanchka Patiji, but I'll probably ask Amitasna ji and Spoka Swami ji can also add on that. That all of us have relationships outside, and many of them are very stressful, toxic relationships. We have bad relationships with bosses, neighbors, friends, spouses, and these do impact us. And it causes a lot of frustration, a lot of external factors. And nowadays, there's a huge discussion on mental well-being. So, what are your tips that you could give so that we could keep our mental sanity also intact and deal with all these challenges? Yeah, there was a time when uh, <clears throat> we were overly focused on IQ. So, if our companies were to go to campus for recruitment, they would be focused on aptitude tests, which were primarily designed to measure a person's IQ. But after some time, people realized this was in the year 1990s when Daniel Goldman wrote a book on emotional quotient. They realized it's not just the IQ which is important. It's also very important for a person to have a good EQ, emotional quotient. Because they found out that the person could be very intelligent, very sharp as far as analytical abilities are concerned. But unless he has a good emotional balance, good interpersonal skills, he would not be doing well in his job or in his career. So then the focus came on EQ, emotional quotient. And then later on, people started realizing there is some another important aspect in human personality, human behavior, which is even more important than EQ. And this was a book written by a person in Oxford University. The book was on spiritual quotient, SQ. And they realized that SQ is our ultimate intelligence. So when a person has good SQ, automatically he will have a good EQ. EQ is a subset of a good SQ. When a person has good SQ, naturally a person will have more resilience and ability to tolerate ups and downs in lives. He will be equipoised in happiness and distress. And I think that's what helps us to deal with all uh, so-called uh, toxicity in human relationships. No doubt we also in our day-to-day -day life encounter people who are mean, at times who are selfish. We have to deal with so many people. But I think this perspective of life helps us to handle such issues with uh, proper perspective. Absolutely. I think at some point of time, uh, relationships are important and education system focuses more on marks get the test passed. But I think your suggestions on spiritual quotient, which is also quite relevant to build the emotional quotient, can balance the two. Chanchalapati ji, you were saying something? I wanted to ask the esteemed panelists. Uh, you're saying spiritual intelligence gives, uh, naturally gives good emotional intelligence and such things. Are there uh, instances of divorce among the devotees or they, because their SQ is so high, there is no divorce at all. Does your statistics show that? Uh, yes. Uh, as far as uh, divorces are concerned, we know the number is phenomenally high in present day world. I was reading an article which says that about 65% of uh, so-called marriages break in the US and the number is quite catching up all over the world. Sometimes, yes, frequency mismatch can happen. When two individuals come together to live a life together, there are many parameters which are involved. But compared to the figures outside, the numbers for a person who is spiritual, bent of mind, a spiritual perspective is quite minuscule. It's quite a small fraction. But yes, I would not shun away from the fact that Yes, sometimes incompatibility also arises among devotee couples. Absolutely. Madhu Pandeji? The, yeah. The, if at all there are such divorces, you can say that they're not developed enough spiritual quotient. 
so it's not that you know everybody in iskon is successful in developing to that extent so there are different degrees of sq uh, you know that uh, devotees develop so if they really develop sq then you know prabhupad says you cannot divorce that's you have to leave and that's 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 a spiritual elevation for both of you know both parties to 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 see a higher uh, uh, principle being followed and take satisfaction in that i think this concept of human relationship in spiritual life is very important and on that that note i'd like to bring a question from one of our listeners from delhi abhishek goel he asks the question that are there women in the temples is marriage permitted or do you have to always be a sanyasi to be a monk and hence do the krishna conscious path actually uh uh women uh, are permitted in iskon and uh, they add a lot of color uh, to our organization as well as they add to the amount of uh, uh, the, the they add to the fun that we all have in the sense that they 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 also you know the women bring in a certain kind of uh, perspective and they bring in their creativity into our organization so uh, if you look at from a spiritual perspective uh, the uh, the uh, our philosophy and our practices are meant at the very fundamental level of the soul so there is no discrimination on the basis of uh, gender caste birth all these kind of things so iskon is such an organization where you will find that uh everybody irrespective of his background whether he is from uh, uh, uh india or america or he is a christian or is he is a hindu is a man he is a woman everybody gets an opportunity equal amount of opportunity to practice to participate in the movement and to express their devotion and service to krishna in various ways so when i said uh, the women add color to our organization it uh, it also uh, means literally because men if you see in iskon we wear only white or saffron but the women are the people who uh, wear all kinds of colorful dresses so that way literally speaking also they had a lot of, a lot of color to our organization but yes uh, there is no bar there is no restriction of any kind of who can participate in this organization who can serve full time or you uh, you uh, uh, be part of the congregation you be an outside supporter of the temple it is possible for everybody irrespective as i said of your background of your caste of your nationality of your gender these things are immaterial and that is the i think a special contribution from shela prabhupa which is really unique to his kaam Amitasna ji, you had a hand at that time, and Vasudev ji, Rajiv ji, go ahead, Amitasna ji. Uh, the point I wanted to make was that even in our panel here today, uh, we have many devotees who are who are grahastas, and even in our scriptures, we have twelve mahajanas, great authorities in spiritual uh, subject matter. Even many of them. were grahasthas were married so that way marriage is a bona fide ashrama in our spiritual so called lineage rajiv ji please go ahead <clears throat> so i would continue with basically the vedic system of way of life is the life is divided into four divisions basically Uh, generally we begin with brahmacharya and uh, on the direction of the spiritual master if the disciple is not able to continue further brahmacharya on the order of the spiritual master he can enter into grahasthashram so there is a place where a person can get married and then after that there is vanaprastha and there is sanyas so practically you can find all four on this panel itself 
there are sannyasis there are brahmacharis and uh, there are grahasthas of course no one prastha here <laughs> vasudev ji yeah no i think my point is already made out of the nine panelists that we are uh, or made uh, including including you we are uh, six grahasthas and only three uh, brahmacharis so uh, women are not only allowed they are most welcome and uh, grihastha ashrama brahmachari ashram the word ashram is very important ashram means a place where spiritual practices are done so even though women are with us we are married but whether we are married or unmarried sanyasi brahmachari grihastha whatever all of us are together practicing spiritual life that is called an ashrama a place where spiritual life is practiced so that is the grihastha ashram with women devotees madhu pandit ji women also join this krishna consciousness movement when they are single and then you know prabhupad that was the way prabhupad you know did not discriminate krishna consciousness missionary life for even women he did not discriminate between men and women and that's how most of the most of the you know devotees who in the as missionaries who are who are married grahasthas they're all uh, you know um, like minded people who are married so it makes no difference whether one is a brahmachari or grahastha because they, everybody is the, the the wife's goal is same husband's goal is same same thing so it's nothing like a, you know it's just like two brahmacharis are staying in the ashram together here you know men and women stays that's all the difference is because the goal is completely the same it's not like a, even in this con temple if those become grahasthas they don't have a kind of a you know separate uh, uh, all the characteristics that you have outside grahastha you know to make money and to have our own wealth and then you know our own security nothing not this things because prabhupad said you have to be if you want to be in the temple as a grahastha then you have to be like a brahmana brahmana means he does not think about his tomorrow his his tomorrow he won't think he'll think of the lord's tomorrow lord's work so even even uh, you know women can you know take up leadership everything in this movement there is nothing there is no limitation so i think on this there could be a question and i think there already is a question from savitri ji from bhopal that right now we're all men is there a future where on this panel on women leaders of iscon or leaders of iscon will there be women in the future or can there be women right now of course they can be there is no difficulty in that then they can be okay i think it's a matter of time then i hope this panel will have many many more women than all of us just men right now so i hope that day comes much more faster so i think this was a great conversation yes i learned a lot from this and i hope all of our listeners out there who are watching this would learn a lot more things tips and techniques from monks in the metro missionaries and leaders of iskon bangalore who do their work their service in the movement of krishna consciousness thank you so much all of you uh, from the bottom of my heart my gratitude to madhu pandit ji chanchala pati ji vasudev ji toka swami ji satya gaurav ji rajiv ji suvakta ji and amit asna ji thank you very much and hare krishna thank you to you all from all of us thank you hare krishna hare krishna